everybody, and welcome to the Hot Topics in Research Ethics uh, today, sponsored by the Masters of Research Ethics Studies Program at University of Malaya and Johns Hopkins University. I'm Jeremy Sugarman. I'm one of the co-principal investigators on the grant, and I'm joined um, with Adiba Kemarul-Zaman, who is the other co-principal investigator. Um, we've had an exciting series of hot topics. Um, you can see those um, uh, that they're available at the Berman Institute of Bioethics um, website and recordings of those are made possible. Um, you know you're in this session and our upcoming session will be um, on June 8th uh, by Julian Savulescu, who's the new director of the program at the National University of Singapore. Um, the Moray program uh, was supported by, it is supported by US NIH grant uh, from the Fogarty International Center. Um, we've actually just been renewed, um, and so we'll be continuing um, for another five years. The program currently is a um, full-time one-year program, um, and the intake is uh, in September and October, and the application period is now. Um, so we are looking for applicants. If you're not currently enrolled or one of our alums, please consider enrolling, and you can get information about that at the website that's listed. There are some scholarships available for selected applicants from low and middle income Southeast Asian countries. And what we hope to do is to um, produce graduates who are equipped with the knowledge and skills necessary to engage in the field of health research ethics. Um, the, it is the full year, year uh, program, but it can be um, done over a slightly longer period of time depending on uh, individual circumstances. Now, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Adiba. And how, to how, our, how are things in terms of the recruitment? Go thanks, ahead. thanks, Jeremy. And um, yeah, welcome everyone and good evening from Kuala Lumpur. I'm really happy to be here with our next um, episode of Moray Hot Topics and uh, a pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Rajay Skanda. Shah Raja Azwa, who uh, is currently the president of the Malaysian AIDS Council, in addition to being an associate professor at the um, University of Malaya. And he's a clinical lead at our Center for HIV Services and has been a principal investigator for a number of uh, antiretroviral clinical trials. And he's leading the, um, the implementation and scale-up of PrEP in Malaysia together with uh, colleagues at the Ministry of Health. Our second speaker and panelist is Dr. Jerome Singh, who's currently an adjunct um, professor at the Dala, how do I say this? The Dala Lana School of Public Health, University of Toronto, Canada. And Dr. Singh, um, it uh, has a PhD in law from the University of Natal and has had a vast experience as a consultant um, to WHO and is currently the PI for SAGE on emergencies. He has a um, long and illustrious uh, career in health law and research ethics. So um, we can kick off this uh, this is the plan for um, this evening's session. Iskandar is going to uh, give an overview of the signs. Just um, so, yeah, so the plan is for Iskandar to give an overview of PrEP and uh, community perception of it, and uh, followed by Jerome, who will discuss um, uh, essentially the issues around post-trial access, and then we'll have a panel discussion around the topics. Yeah, so Iskandar. Um, great. Okay. Um, thanks very much. I'll just try and share my screen now. If that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so thanks very much, uh, Adi Benjamin, for um, inviting me to speak today. So I'm going to be talking about the science and community perception behind long-acting HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. Now, as, as I'm speaking to a wider audience, um, I'll start by introducing what PrEP is uh, or HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis is all about uh, and speaking then about the opportunities and challenges 
of long-acting pre-exposure prophylaxis and introducing the science behind some of the pivotal studies leading to um, uh, approval of, of the long-acting PrEP studies. And then uh, briefly talk about implementation considerations and finally end on key population perceptions of long-acting PrEP. Now, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, is, is medication that you can take uh, to prevent HIV infection. It can be taken, bef uh, it's normally, as its name suggests, is pre-exposure, uh, so it's taken before um, the onset of exposure, whether it's through sexual intercourse or otherwise. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, um, clinical trial data to support the efficacy of using oral uh, HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis in the form of a drug called tenofovir combined with emtricitabine. These are drugs which are used to treat HIV infection, but in this context is used to prevent HIV infection. We, ha we are, however, lagging behind in terms of global targets. Uh, this is a slide on PrEP initiations by country in December 2022. Uh, and we can see that some parts of the world do better, particularly Australia, the United States, uh, Brazil, and some countries are lagging behind or have no data. So some parts of Northern Africa, uh, a lot of Russia, and certain parts of Southeast Asia. So the evidence essentially behind the use of oral PrEP uh, largely is depicted here. It's, it's, it's a, a number of randomized control trial data, which has uh, been used in, in, in several different uh, key populations, be it men who have sex with men, uh, transgendered women, uh, people who inject drugs. And it's shown efficacy in the ranges of essentially 49% uh, to about 86%. Uh, and this is largely related to adherence or taking the drug. So understandably, if you take the drug, you're more likely uh, you're more likely to gain benefit in terms of HIV prevention. And these are also, and this is also shown in this slide. So adherence, the key determinant of PrEP trial outcomes. So some of the earlier studies involving HIV serodiscordant women in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, so the FEMPREP studies, for example, showed low rates of efficacy in women, and this was largely related to a poorer adherence for a number of contextual reasons. Currently, what we have is not so bad, but we can do better. So what we have now is oral tenofovir emtricitabine or a more kidney-friendly version called tenofovir alphenamide combined with emtricitabine. Uh, and there's some advantages and disadvantages of this drug. Um, the advantages are that you can take it either daily or on demand, which is essentially related to exposure. Uh, there's flexibility in implementation. There's minimal clinical monitoring from a, a, a healthcare provider perspective for majority of patients is available across different key populations. You still have to access care and you need to take a HIV test um, every three months to ensure that you stay HIV negative. Um, and the other advantage is that, is that we have generic versions of the drug widely available globally. But pills may not be necessarily acceptable for certain populations. And that this is where injectable drugs come, uh, injectable HIV prevention drugs come in. So what are some of the opportunities? Well, clearly less frequent dosing. Like the contraceptive world, uh, we have found that if you increase choice for patients, it's likely to increase PrEP uptake in this case. It protects uh, health privacy. It's more likely to be discreet and therefore by extension, less stigmatizing. Um, PrEP is good, but there are concerns within programs that people tail off in the end. Uh, and this is due to suboptimal adherence and people retaining in care. And injectables address this issue. Uh, it provides superior protection, and we'll show that later. There's no drug-drug interactions with gender-affirming therapy used by transgendered women. It is directly observed therapy. So the moment you get an injection, you know that the patient is taking the drug. And there's possibility of co-formulation with other long-acting drugs, such as contraceptives and et cetera, which make it more favorable. But there are challenges with long-acting PrEP. Clearly cost, and that will be covered later on in resource considerations. The need for additional clinic visits every two months. Currently, long-acting carbotegravir is given every two months. And the standard of care at the moment for most people on oral PrEP is, is, is that they have to return every three months uh, to care. The injectables at the moment cannot be self-administered, though this is being studied. Gluteal injections, so injections into the bum, 
uh, can cause issues to particular uh, populations, such as those who are obese or those who have buttock implants, and then, of course, injection site reactions. And then knowledge gaps for vulnerable populations, which are not included in clinical trials, including, including pregnancy and breastfeeding, where there's limited safety data, young people, sex workers, and people who use drugs. There are concerns about what to do if you miss doses, how to manage certain drug-drug interactions, for example, with TB. And involving injectable carbotegravir has led to more frequent need for HIV testing and more sophisticated HIV testing algorithms. There are also concerns with regards to um, development of resistance uh, where the drugs don't work anymore with, with infections that occur despite having been given the drug on time. So this is what essentially we're talking about is a long acting drug. It's given in the bum every eight weeks after initial four week interval period. Uh, often these drugs are preceded by four week oral uh, lead in, but this is now optional. And they have initially, there were a lot of concerns around the drug staying in the blood system for a little while uh, because detectable concentrations of the drug can continue to be detected up to about 76 weeks. So far, as of 30th of March 2023, that I can find, only five countries have received regulatory approvals for use of PrEP. These are the United States, Australia, and three, um, uh, three African countries, Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Malawi. So the evidence uh, behind um, uh, the use of long-acting injectable carbotegravir compared to the standard of care, which is oral Truvada, largely come from two very sound uh, randomized controlled trials. They're called HPTN 083 and 084. Uh, they're randomized double uh, blind phase three clinical trials and long-acting injectable carbotegravir demonstrated superiority compared to the standard of care, which was the oral tenofovir FTC in both trials. HPTN 083 involved uh, men who have sex with men and transgendered women, up to 4,500 participants. Uh, and here, uh, the hazard ratio uh, was 0 0.30, 0 0.34, which essentially showed that um, carbotegravir reduced the HIV incidence by 66% compared to oral Truvada. Um, there were 25 new onset infections on long-acting carbotegravir, and this is a, and six cases of which occurred despite the injections being on time and subsequent development of resistance. And this is of concern. The HPTN 084 involves cisgender women, mainly in sub-Saharan African sites. Uh, and here the hazards ratio of injectable carbotegravir was 0 0.11. So an 89% reduction in HIV incidence compared to the oral standard of care. And this magnitude of reduction has never see, been seen with oral PrEP in women uh, in, in any of the oral PrEP studies. So this is a huge and significant finding which needs to be celebrated. There were seven incident infections on long-acting carbotegravir, but none with injections within two weeks of target dose and no integrase resistance. This is just being depicted in, in, in this chart. So uh, once again, uh, this is HPTN 083. Uh, this was associated with a 66% reduction in HIV and incidence in MSM and transgender women. And, and the, equi the equivalent uh, um, uh, clinical trial in, in women uh, with a significant reduction of about 89% reduction in HIV incidence compared to oral Truvada. Now, when you, broke this, when you break this down further into subgroups, you find if there was an added benefit in certain, uh, certain variables, uh, this was shown to be uh, um, uh, have an, an, a, a protective effect across a range of variables, including those less than 30 years, different populations, including transgender women and US Black participants. Uh, this was similar across the HPTN 084. Uh, CAB LA was associated with lower HIV incidence than those under the age of 25 across a different use of contraceptive methods and individuals with higher BMIs. Now, injection site reactions were common. This was unsurprising. They were mild to moderate in severity, and reports of injection site reactions decreased over time. Both Across both studies, this rarely led to discontinuations uh, with the injectable drug. 
Now, this, this slide is a bit more technical. It talks about um, the effect on HIV testing and resistance, and I'll try and put it in, uh, in, in, in sort of simpler terms to understand. Uh, Long-acting injectable carbotegravir is able to reduce the HIV viral replication and has an effect on delaying the antibody production in HIV antigen antibody tests compared to the oral um, Truvada. Um, and as a result, um, they may fail to detect infection at an earlier stage, and this can lead to concerns around integrase resistance. And for example, when we compare the delays in uh, incident and baseline infections in HPTN 083, carbotegravir uh, resulted in delays of 62 days on average for baseline infections compared to 34 days in Truvada, 98 days for incident infections and 31 days for Truvada. So there was a two to three times delay in the diagnosis for um, HIV test uh, for HIV diagnosis. Uh, integrase resistance, when it occurs, occurs at a point where the virus is very high at high carb carbotegravir concentrations. And this was very surprising because everybody was concerned initially that new infections and subsequent development of integrase resistance would occur during the pharmacokinetic tail. This is subsequently impacted on PrEP guidelines around HIV testing in the CDC, which now recommend that you should use viral load testing every two months with long-acting carbotegravir. Now, this is, of course, not um, an option for many countries uh, in low- and middle-income settings, and WHO takes a more um, rational approach about not necessarily switching to HIV uh, testing using RNA testing, but using a testing algorithm that's already present in the country um, as such. So this is now reflected in, 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 in uh, the WHO guidelines. This was re released uh, in Montreal in July of 2022 last year, where WHO made recommendations of the use of this long-acting, highly effective injectable drug as an additional prevention choice for people at substantial risk of HIV infection. And this was that so countries could start at least thinking about using it in low and middle income settings, as well as inclusion within the guidelines. But there is always a disconnect between what we see in clinical trial data and what subsequently happens in terms of implementation science. And this is where implementation science is very much needed to advance this highly effective HIV prevention choice. Currently, a lot of the data that we have is limited to clinical trial settings, and we don't have real-world data for certain populations which have not been represented in the tr clinical trials, so such as sex workers, people who inject drugs, and transgender men. So there is a need for implementation science to determine questions like, can we use alternative injection sites other than the bum? Can we train people? Uh, can we train people to administer self injections? What are the implications of potential integrase resistance uh, as a result of CAB LA? And we have a paucity of safety data in pregnancy and breastfeeding. We need to also ensure that um, prep service deliveries, which are now been pushed out to the community, are maintained in differentiated service delivery models, uh, making it continuing it to be patient centered and we need to best define the optimal HIV testing strategies, and also how to start, stop, and switching between PrEP options. And these, and so injectable carbotegravir compared to oral Truvada does very well in terms of frequency of product use, but not so well in terms of uh, having to be provided by a healthcare worker in a healthcare setting. And also the, the use of more sophisticated HIV testing strategies, uh, and of course, and this will be covered, I'm sure, later in terms of cost and availability of genetic product availability, it's, it's, it does very badly at this current stage. So there's a wealth of implementation studies, which in, include CAB LA for PrEP, which are underway. Uh, and we have three studies just to highlight in Asia, in Thailand, Vietnam, and Australia, looking at specific issues such as key population-led delivery of CAB LA, uh, as, as which is uh, planned in Thailand. Now, moving to the second bit of, uh, um, um, the, and very quickly through this, um, uh, the second bit of the talk, and which is to key populations, perceptions and opinions. So what do communities think about long acting antiretrovirals? Now, there's not a huge amount of data around this, but this is coming gradually and uh, over the past year. And I've tried to summarize essentially uh, from a couple of, pay, uh, uh, couple of publications. So in terms of prevention, users have diverse preferences and needs, which change over time. 
Long acting key, uh, long acting prep is generally preferred by key populations which assume uh, episodic risk or who are unable to negotiate other HIV prevention strategies such as condoms, uh, so particularly around female sex workers, transgender women and adolescents. In countries like Australia, where the use of oral PrEP is high, MSM are interested in alternatives to daily PrEP. Young MSM have an interest in long acting PrEP, but what's important is that they've voiced concerns around barriers to access to healthcare. And what they want particularly is detailed information to avoid medical mistrust. We know that transgender women and people who inject drugs have been underrepresented in clinical trials, and we need to better understand their preferences and concerns. With transgender women, transgender specific needs, particularly around gender affirming therapies, are very high on their list of priorities. Long acting PrEP can potentially empower female sex workers who disproportionately suffer from sexual violence. Female sex workers and transgenders do not want products that leave scars or are visible and would want to avoid uh, particularly buttocks where they may have implants and sites of injection. Across the different key populations, there's preference for self-injections and administration outside the health sector. We do not want to re-medicalize services and bring them back into the clinic. And there are, of course, concerns around additional clinic visits and costs and impact on daily lives, which are important barriers. But like everything in life, what key populations want is better communication. And communication strategies need to be adapted and framed towards each group when implementing these options. And what's important that this is explained in terms of three things, efficacy, adverse events and safety, and potential for long acting prep to interact with other medications that they take. And this is just a couple of publications which uh, I've summarized it from. Uh, and this is uh, divided according to uh, key populations. So you have men who have sex with men, uh, you have transgendered women where there's a paucity of information around key uh, um, uh, perceptions. Uh, people who inject drugs also uh, very few um, uh, data coming from it, but where there is, and this is by from a colleague, the willingness to use long acting PrEP is high. And some of the concerns which have specifically mentioned around people who use drugs are waning, concerns around waning efficacy over time. Now bring it all closer to home, and this is values and preferences on options for HIV PrEP among MSM and transgender women in Asia. This is as yet unpublished data, uh, but, you, but where the strengths lie essentially is a large data set of over 20,000 men who have sex with men and 1,500 transgender women from 15 countries in Asia. It was a cross-sectional online survey implemented by WHO, UNAIDS, PATH, FHI 360, and partnered with research partners, Kirby Institute, Monash, and IHRI, and EPCOM. So the preliminary findings essentially are there is 75% uh, were aware of PrEP, but only 17% had heard of long-acting carbotegravir. 12%, so not very high, willing to take CAB, LA, despite low previous awareness. 30% expressed a preference over oral PrEP. And unsurprisingly, transgendered women had a higher preference for CAB LA compared to the other populations. This is now bringing even closer to home and some data that we, uh, um, we, we published. And this was an online cross-sectional survey of 870 Malaysian MSM, uh, only 9.1% aware of long-acting injectable PrEP. And you find that in Asia, the awareness as such is much lower compared to outside Asia, uh, compared to 81% having heard of oral PrEP. But when given a brief description of long-acting injectable PrEP, 87% were willing to use long-acting PrEP. And the there were correlates associated with willingness to use PrEP, and uh, some correlates were previous engagement to care, as shown in, as shown in the slide. So maybe just to end very quickly, and this will just lead on probably to the next lecture quite nicely, just use as a case example, Malaysia is an upper middle income country with a GPD per capita of USD 11,371. The most important barrier to implementation scale up of this highly, prevent, highly effective preventive drug is of course cost. And currently the US costs it at 3,700 per dose. In Malaysia, it's under patent protection till the uh, October 2027. Malaysia was unfortunately not included in one of the 90 countries which under the CAB voluntary license, which was 
uh, an agreement which was signed by Viv and the medicines patent pool. Uh, a lot of the countries included in that were uh, largely sub-Saharan African countries. And in reality, we might not be able to get the long-acting preventive HIV drug until 2027, which is a long time. So with that, I hope that sets the scene for the next talk. Um, and uh, I'd just like to, uh, to thank uh, and acknowledge um, the various names on the slide. And, um, and I'm happy to take questions later on as part of the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Iskandar for that uh, fantastic overview of the uh, clinical trials and results um, of long-acting campotagravir. And what has been described uh, by many people as a real game changer for HIV prevention, but as you pointed out, it um, uh, is not going to be readily available um, as a result of cost. So we would like to invite um, Dr. Jerome Singh to present his thoughts on this, on post-trial, um, on the ethics in terms of post-trial responsibilities, and uh, maybe um, share your, your thoughts on this matter. Thanks, Jerome. Right. I'm just going to do a share screen. Just give me a few seconds. Okay, can you guys see the screen now? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, very important session. And what I'm going to just try to do very briefly is to go over some of the ethics considerations and in a sense also some of the regulatory considerations when you're looking at the issue of post-trial access. And I'm going to start off by giving you a very brief overview. And I'm not gonna assume that any of you who are participating in today's session have too much of background in terms of ethics guidance document. So I've just kept this to the bare minimum. There are many other guidance documents that major sponsors also publish as well, like the HIV Prevention Trial Network and uh, other major sponsors also have similar type of guidance and policies. But I'm just gonna focus on three major global guidance documents. That's what the Declaration of Helsinki says, which is published by the World Medical Association, the SEOMS guideline, which is the Council for the International Organization of Medical Sciences, which is co-published by the World Health Organization. What does it say about post-trial access? And lastly, what does the UNAIDS and WHO say about uh, post-trial access in their guidance document? So very briefly, as all of us know, we can't really do any research in humans unless that research is approved by a research ethics committee. But also more importantly, um, what's also is, is quite important is that to understand that many research ethics committees rely quite a lot on the, you know, on guidance documents to, to basically guide how the committees make their decisions. So I'm just gonna run through very quickly, a, a very brief history of the Declaration of Helsinki. It gets revised every few years. And through the years, there've been many versions of the Declaration of Helsinki. And I'm just taking you through some of them here, but it's been, it's not something new. Post-trial access considerations are not something new is what I wanted to highlight. And as early as the 2013 version of the Declaration of Helsinki, we had requirements that were put in. So any ethics committee that was relying on this or a regulator, they, it was quite clear what needed to be done and that protocol must describe appropriate ways post-trial access. So after the trial ends, there must be some sort of provision made for what happens to the intervention, whether it's a drug or a vaccine or a pre-exposure prophylaxis. So I'm just going to now skip to the latest version. And uh, essentially, it's not, not even the latest version, but the last version of the Declaration of Helsinki was 2013. And I think there's new versions, a new version is now, you know, being negotiated. But essentially, you can see very clearly it says in advance of a clinical trial, sponsors, researchers, and host country governments should make provisions for post-trial access for all participants 
who still need an intervention identified as beneficial in the trial. And this information must be disclosed to participants during the informed consent process. So right at the start, when you sign your informed consent form, you as a participant must be informed as to what will happen when the trial ends and if the intervention that is being tested is found to be efficacious. And so from 2013, the Declaration of Helsinki started making this quite clear that this needed to be done. But also in addition to that, the Council for the International Organization of Medical Sciences co-published with the WHO in its 2016 guidance document. It also made post-trial availability very, very clear. And it said very briefly, when participants' health needs during and after research cannot be met by the local health infrastructure or the participants' pre-existing health insurance, the research and sponsor must make prior arrangements for adequate care for participants, for the local, the health, local health authorities, members of the communities from which the persons are drawn, or non-governmental organizations such as health advocacy groups. And more specifically, then went on to say that addressing participants' health needs requires at least that researchers and sponsors make plans for, and this is where it becomes quite specific here, how care will be adequately provided for the condition under study, how care will be provided during the research when researchers discover conditions other than those under study. And this is now when we start looking at post-trial access here. They say, looking at providing continued access to study interventions that have demonstrated significant benefit and consulting with other relevant stakeholders, if any, to determine everyone's responsibility and the conditions under which participants will receive continued access to a study intervention, such as an investigational drug that has demonstrated significant benefit in the study. So CIOMS also embraced and moved in the direction of making it much more explicit as to what post-trial obligations are. And then most recently in 2021, we had UNAIDS revise its guidance document and guidance point 14 of UNAIDS also speaks very specifically about post-trial access and dissemination. And it says as part of the protocol, researchers and trial sponsors should have an agreed plan for post-trial access. And in principle, trial sponsors should provide ongoing provision of HIV preventive products that have been demonstrated to be efficacious for all trial participants. And the research team also has a special obligation to ensure the timely dissemination of study progress at regular intervals and to report and publish the final results in peer reviewed journals. Dissemination of progress updates and results to national authorities, local communities and study participants should be a priority and occur before or contemporaneously with international dissemination. So it was quite a clear and very wide obligation that was imposed, an ethical obligation that was imposed by UNAIDS. So I think, you know, all these different guidance documents raise very, very important questions. And I'm just highlighting some of them here for you. So, you know, to whom does post-trial obligations to apply? To Does it apply only to the study participants who participated in the trial or to the wider host community? So in other words, if it was hosted in one town, everybody who has HIV or wants to prevent themselves from getting HIV, all the risk at risk communities, or does it apply to the whole country? So another important question that gets raised with post-trial access is, does post-trial access apply to the control arm versus only the experimental arm if the control arm is not standard of care? Then also the other important questions, which are more gray areas, is what happens if local authorities don't adopt the new intervention, the new pre-exposure prophylaxis? And what mechanisms can be used to enable access? How long should the post-trial access continue? So these are all questions that none of the guidance documents speak about specifically. They don't speak about how long post-trial access should continue, how it should actually happen, should it be what happens if the country doesn't adopt it. So these are important questions that I think you know, we need to consider. So these are some of the ways practically that post-trial access has occurred in some countries before the local regulator has had a chance to review the formal application to register the intervention, and also before the health authority even decides to adopt or to buy or purchase this, or even a sponsor, an international agency deciding to co-sponsor something. So some investigators try to actually get sponsorship for an open label extension. 
for long-term extension study. And essentially, this means that the clinical trial continues for a little bit longer. It becomes open label. So if people were on a placebo, it's now there's no placebo anymore. And people who are on the placebo can be offered this. That's if there is a placebo. And essentially, you'll find that there's no blinding. And you usually find the open label extension continues the current arrangement for the study participants, but only for a relatively short period of time. And you'll find that this is not something that can be considered a long-term solution, but it is something that is often done as a short-term measure. So this has happened in South Africa, for example, many years ago when we were looking at uh, the issue of uh, tenofovir gel, when there was hopes that tenofovir gel would actually prevent HIV. Uh, the organization Kiprisa did a clinical trial. The trial showed demonstrated efficacy but in fact, it was going to take a bigger trial. It was only a phase 2B trial, and regulators were not happy to register the drug. So while the phase 3 trial was being done in another city, the trial participants in the phase 2B trial were continued on tenofovir gel, but through an open-label extension. But what happened there was that the, the intervention didn't ultimately get demonstrated efficacy, and it was not eventually even registered as a product that could prevent HIV. But for a short period of time, those trial participants were provided with the access in the hope that the phase three trial being conducted in another center and in another city would demonstrate efficacy. Other mechanisms that have been proposed are compassionate use programs or expanded access programs. And generally what this is, is that these are regulatory mechanisms that some countries have to allow for early access to an intervention that has not yet been registered. So this is a promising, usually a medication that is not yet registered, but it can be made available to people who need it, usually before they've been authorized or licensed. Uh, however, there are some problems with taking this approach, because compassionate use programs and expanded access programs are basically quite limited and they generally are not designed for prophylactic interventions. They're compassionate use because they help to keep people alive and it's now being proven to be quite you know uh, promising. But the problem here is that pre-exposure prophylaxis does not qualify for compassionate use. It's not keeping people alive in the traditional sense. It's not like a cancer drug or another major medication or even an antiretroviral that's helping to keep very sick HIV patients alive. Generally, PEP is used for people who don't have HIV to prevent them from getting HIV. So regulators have basically said you can't use compassionate use programs for PrEP because it's aimed at healthy people. So you'll find that there have been many, many different types of ways that, you know, investigators and sponsors have tried to in fact continue using PrEP and I've mentioned some of them to you. So we've had open label extension studies or rollover studies. I've, I've, there's quite a lot of text here. I'm not gonna go through this in too much detail with you, but also these interventions have been done in implementation studies where it's being slowly rolled out, but people who are part of the trial can be included in that. So they continue to get access. And then of course you have a demonstration project or a pilot project where you may in fact start rolling it out in one site or two sites in a country, but generally very often you can start off where the clinical trial site was so that individuals who are part of the clinical trial can be included in the demonstration or the pilot study. So these have also been other mechanisms that have been put forward to ensure that study participants have access to the intervention before it's formally registered. So you'll find that from an ethics perspective, these are some of the challenges that have been raised and some of the issues that have come up where ethicists have said that post-trial access may in fact cause study participants, it may become what we call in ethics an undue inducement where the incentive is to join the trial, but the incentive is so big, the person wouldn't have ordinarily joined the trial but because this is the only way for them to get access to the intervention, they participate in the trial. So we call that an undue inducement. 
there's another objection that has been raised. And some people have argued that post-trial access may delay trials because of procedures and agreements to be made with the government sponsors and researchers may become too complicated. So the trial just gets delayed and eventually may not even get done. And then another argument that's been raised is that post-trial access provisions may prevent a trial from happening because it's gonna to become too expensive for the sponsor. And so sponsors may decide just not to do the trial, especially in low and middle income countries. It's just not something that's feasible for them. They don't want to take the responsibility of paying for this drug for nobody knows how many years or how long that period of time would be. And then of course, some people, some ethicists have, have also said that post-trial access may be misused as a marketing tool because you're trying to basically promote this drug in the meantime. So these are some of the ethics issues that have been raised. But I think what I thought I would just very briefly do in conclusion is to discuss how this is role, you know, how this is happening and unfolding in South Africa, which is, you know, has the highest burden of HIV in the world. So South Africa has, you know, around about 8 million people with HIV. So the need to prevent others, especially young women in South Africa from getting HIV is quite a lot. And oral PrEP has been available in South Africa since at least 2016. And today the pill is available at more than 2000 sites around the country. But when cabotegravir was announced to be efficacious, a lot of talk was, you know, when is South Africa going to get this? Because it was one of the host countries that hosted the trial that demonstrated that Cab LA was in fact efficacious. So there was a lot of questions about this. And, you know, essentially, according to Unit 8, South Africa will begin rolling out and piloting Cab LA in 2023. It's already received regulatory approval in South Africa, but it, the public health sector has not yet begun to roll it out. But according to Unit Aid, which will be the purchaser and maybe the sponsor, this could happen sometime in 2023. And of course, we're four months now into 2023. But I just put these other stats here just because these are also important ethics issues to consider. And that is that, you know, modeling suggests that the injection could prevent as many as 52,000 new HIV infections in South Africa over the next two decades if it's rolled out nationally. And in February 2022, Cab annual price was announced as $22,200 per annum or $3,700 per dose. And to be cost effective in South Africa, the price of Cab must fall to less than 1% of the official US price tag. And Vive, the developer, has basically said that this is unrealistic. So, you know, this is where we are at this point in time. And, you know, uh, it's just lots of important issues for people to consider. But, you know, I thought I'd just put these issues out there that initially there was a lot of concern that there would be no provisions made for South Africa as one of the major trial sites that contributed the numbers to help demonstrate that the Cab LA works. And then the concern was that it's now not being made available. It's too expensive. We now have sponsors that have come on board international agencies. And the government said, we will actually adopt it, but we're going to roll it out in a pilot site and a pilot study and roll it out first and see how this goes. So essentially, you know, this is where we are at, in, at this point in time in a host country of the, of the trial sites, of the trial country that actually, you know, hosted the trial. So there are many ethics issues and many, you know, ethics guidance documents that speak to how investigators and sponsors in particular, and even the health authorities need to really give post-trial access consideration before trial even commences. And once we actually have post-trial access, while you can have shorter measures in the form of, you know, open label extension studies, rollover studies, those are very short-term measures and for very short periods of time. And I think the big issue with Cab LA and other interventions that may roll out and exciting new promising ones is how much is it going to cost? And will the host country be able to afford this? And this is of course a very important ethics issue from an equity perspective as well. So I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take questions a little bit later as well. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Jerome and Niskander. Those were uh, two fantastic presentations. A little longer than we thought, but but we had a lot of ground to cover and um, very, very interesting. Just um, we'll start um, discussing um, in one second, but I just want to remind everyone who's uh, joined, um, if you do have a question for the uh, speakers, please put them in the Q&A function. It works best uh, for these uh, webinars if we could do that. And I'll ask Jerome to stop screen sharing uh, if possible as well. 
uh, to um, free up a little bit of bandwidth there for folks. So there actually, before we start, there is a quick factual question. Maybe Iskander, you can handle this one um, in the chat. Uh, uh, the question was, during the trial, is the injections given for free to the participants? So absolutely, during the clinical trial, the injection is given for free um, in both arms. Absolutely, yes. Okay, and that's that's great. And then there's another question um, from Emily Thong that says, does any government offer any incentives to aid for implementation of post-drug access, for instance, tax relief, et cetera? I don't know, Jerome, if you have a answer to that one or Iskender may as well. There's usually no incentives, but generally, uh, you know, the issue is not so much giving incentives, but trying to get drug companies to reduce their pricing. So in recent years, philanthropic organizations and international agencies have really stepped up their efforts to co-sponsor access in certain places. And you find that major uh, lobby groups of philanthropic organizations like the Clinton, Clinton Foundation and others help to negotiate lower prices. So, you know, the Global Fund may step in, the Global Fund for AIDS, TB and malaria, they step in, the Clinton Foundation steps in, they negotiate, you know, really big amounts for discounted rates. So, and they basically sometimes will co-sponsor this or arrange or you know, raise funds for this. So this is how we get economy of scale where the, the price comes down if the country commits to, you know, buying a certain portion. And when you get big quantities supplied, the cost comes down. So generally, uh, the general requirement is that if a drug company wants to sell a particular drug in a particular country, they've got to register that drug in that company, in that country. And that means making an application, providing the dossier to that drug authority, the national drug authority in that country. So, you know, those are the only costs, but generally uh, countries don't offer tax incentives for drug companies to offer drugs in those countries, not usually anyway. Okay, great. Um, you know, one of the, the issues that I think both the HPT and 083 and 084 um, faced, my understanding is that um, there has been a concern among many participants about the, the length of time that it's taken to secure post-trial access. And um, I wonder if people want to want to think about that. I mean, I think in reality, post-trial access is always really difficult to achieve because of all the complexities that both Iskander and Jerome have raised. Um, what are your What are your thoughts about uh, the ethical issues in sort of delay of post-trial access? Anyone want to take that one on? So, Jeremy, I'll, I'll try, but I think I just want to just make sure that I got the question there. So, I think you said, what are some of the issues relating to delays in post-trial access? Yeah. So I think, you know, when the trial ends, I think this is why it's very, very important for trial investigators and sponsors way before trial ends, because, you know, we don't know when the trial is going to end. If it demonstrates spectacular success, the trial could end on the basis of efficacy way before the scheduled period of time. And that is why it's very important for plans to be put in place in case the product demonstrates efficacy very prematurely or you know, quite early on and overwhelmingly demonstrates efficacy, the trial could be stopped. The data and safety monitoring board is monitoring results on an ongoing basis. And if the trial suddenly has to end, there has to be provisions put in place by the trial sponsor and the investigators in terms of what happens to those people who are receiving the efficacious intervention in the trial, but also those who are maybe receiving the standard of care, which may not be you know, either placebo or something else, but they need to make provisions for that. And that is how other types of designs have come about like open label extensions and those types of things that I mentioned a little bit earlier. So those are seen at best as temporary, um, you know, temporary measures in the period of time between when the trial results have now been, because it takes quite a while. I think this is the other important thing for people to understand. When a trial ends, it takes quite a while for the data in a sense to be cleaned, for the investigators to write up the results for that to be submitted to a journal for publication. And at the same time, you've got these dossiers that have to be put together by the, you know, by the developer or manufacturer, the drug sponsor. They've got to now send it to the drug regulatory agency 
So, you know, the drug regulatory agencies play, play two roles. They've got to approve the trial, but that's at a trial level. But at the same time, they've also got to approve later downstream if the drug is going to be registered. And that can take quite a while. So, the, you know, they may request further information. Putting together the dossier path for the drug company is quite a, a long procedure. And, you know, the regulators can take quite a long time to go through that. They may request first further information. So the bottom line that I'm saying here is that it can take, you know, a couple of years sometimes for regulatory approval to actually happen. Sometimes faster if everything is happening well. But I think we need to understand that, you know, the trial investigators are human. They've got to write up the trial results. Uh, that has can only be done within a certain period of time. It takes quite a complex things. It goes through peer review. The reviewers come back with more, you know, comments. They may announce it at a conference, but that's not going to get it regulated. So during all that period of time, it could be months and sometimes a couple of years, if not longer. And the trial sponsor investigators have to consider that. And that's how open label extensions were seen as a short term measure. But even then, you know, you may have enough drug for only a certain period of time and not beyond that. And so, you know, these are things that I think the drug manufacturer has to give some consideration to is that if the regulatory period is longer to get approval for the drug, what happens in that period of time? And then some countries have a split healthcare system, the private sector and the public sector, are they going to only, you know, is the, is the public sector, the government going to buy these products? Should it be made available to the private sector? And then in countries like the US, health insurers have to commit to buying the drug or, you know, basically supporting the reimbursement for those purchases. So I think, you know, these are all the things that happen as well that are quite important considerations to consider as well because the drug may get registered in a country you may have open label extensions and get short-term access for that drug product but i think one of the challenges is what happens if the drug insurance the health insurer doesn't actually pay for the drug you know those are some of the challenges that i think we need to be thinking about as well or if the government doesn't decide to actually buy it what do we do yeah. Yeah, Jerome, uh, you've opened up a very, very important um, area of discussion in terms of, um, you know, in terms of drug development or indeed vaccine development to think of a, a real end to end kind of plan um, when when you do these things. It's moving away a little bit from um, long acting tebotegravir to, of course, uh, the race to find um, new vaccines for a whole host of, of pathogens as well as cancer using the highly successful mRNA technology in, um, with, with COVID that uh, I think these aspects of thinking ahead of um, what to do so that we don't find ourselves in the, in the COVID-19 Cavalier situation once again and that these things have, be, have to be discussed way in advance um, and not not just wait um, till the end and, and then negotiate the prices. Uh, very important point. Great. So we only have a few minutes left. We have four minutes left. There are three questions in the chat. Um, what I think I'm gonna do is uh, I'll just combine two of these questions um, and then um, ask Jerome to answer uh, another one very quickly. And then we'll have everyone hopefully can make a, a quick closing comment. Um, Gertrude um, Kiwanuka raises, who will determine how long CAB LA pro sterile access will last in South Africa or any other country like LMIC, like Uganda? What happens if the sponsor suggests a duration and then REC refuses um, and she go, and goes on? And then there's a related question uh, from an anonymous attendee. What happens if different countries involved in trial have different standards and regulations for post-trial access? Just want to clear up um, one um, issue is that post-trial access happens after the main research trial ends. What Jerome mentioned is that there are some research alternatives during this interim period to provide access that may involve an open label extension. So if you're using one of the mechanisms that Jerome and Iskander uh, talked about some of these as well, um, that are that are continued to be research or different forms of research to figure out if it works in other populations, those would fall under a, re, a rec, but post-trial access would happen under the in the context of regular medical care. And it's that transition period of providing it. So there are two pathways. And so because of the diversity, there's no quick answer to either of those, but every country is going to have different regulations related to um, the registration of drugs and delivery of care. So um, I think it, it's something to be negotiated. 
There is a quick question from Deborah Donnell, who was the statistician on these trials, um, asking, I think the question for Jerome would probably know, what's the current progress for negotiating price discounts for uh, GAB LA in South Africa, I guess? Or, and yes, so I think unit aid is actually driving some of that. And so I'm not sure what happens behind the scenes at unit aid, but I think unit aid and probably organizations like the Clinton Foundation are discussing issues like pricing. But you know, the bottom line is that it's not sustainable. The prices that you pay in the US are not sustainable for South Africa or any other low and middle income country. It's just not gonna be sustainable at all. The government would not be able to commit to that. So the prices really do need to come down. And you know, you'll find that activists may say, well, then let's issue a compulsory license. If, it, if the drug manufacturer developer can't produce it at that price, let somebody else produce it give it to CIPLA, give it to anybody else. But you know, those may, we don't know what the implications would be in terms of the complexity of developing the drug or in terms of manufacturing it. So, you know, those are things that happened during COVID. People said, well, let's get Pfizer to, to you know, give a compulsory license and let somebody else manufacture it. Well, you know, mRNA vaccines are very difficult to manufacture. So it's not easy of just issuing compulsory license and somebody else does it. There's, you know, obviously quite a lot of uh, background that you need to have and experience that you need to have to manufacture some of these interventions. So I think these have been proposed as ways to lower the price of drugs, but I think the first price would be for the drug company to lower their price. And I think that's a major challenge that does, it's not unique to Cab LA, it's unique, it, it's, it applies to every single new intervention that comes out, especially, you know, we, we involved in HIV in the cancer field, it's even more expensive sometimes. Awesome. We are actually at time. Um, there is an exit survey uh, that you'll receive when you leave the webinar, and we'd appreciate your input on that. I so, apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, we can make maybe like one minute if people want to, the panelists want to just say a passing really quick comment. Um, we could go on with this discussion for some time, but in respect for people's time, I think we'd, we will need to end. So um, Iskander, if you wanted to have a final word or Deba or Jerome, we'll, we'll take those, but be quick. Yeah, I'll just go very quickly. I think um, we, we certainly should be learning from lessons of the past in terms of excess. This is not new to us. You know, we've been in this antiretroviral field for some time, and the lessons that have applied to all other oral antiretroviral drugs should be applied here. And it's such a shame that we haven't reached the stage um, where we're learning from those lessons. Awesome. Adiba, did you want to? No, no, nothing to add apart from, um, you know, the, the 90 countries that have uh, been given license uh, or five, five companies that have been given the license uh, to produce Cab LA for 90 countries. It's, it's kind of, I wonder if you um, know the progress of, of that um, negotiation with MPP. <laughs> yeah, from what I understand, that was announced at the end of March. Uh, it was three companies, in, three Indian companies. They were Aurobindo, Cipla, and Viatris. And that really was literally announced uh, at the end of March. So, and it was put up on their website. So I think it's still very much in the initial stages. So I think we have a long way to go still with respect to that. And, Thank you. And, uh, awesome. Real, again, we could go on forever. Jerome, did you have a, a farewell comment? while we let people go or just the take home comment is always start planning way in advance presume that the intervention is going to work and start making the plans for access post-trial access don't presume and start those preparations at the end of the trial awesome well thanks everyone again I apologize please um, answer the uh, survey this will the recording of this will be available online within about a week and uh, please join us for our our next um, session um, thanks again for joining and thanks to the panelists for an amazing job. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, Jerome.